Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the Lord Burley 500 Lecture, which is a joint project between the City of London Corporation, the Lord Burley Foundation and Gresham College. My name is William Russell and I'm the 692nd Lord Mayor of the City of London. I know that many of you watching have been eagerly awaiting tonight's lecture. Indeed, it was supposed to take place just about a year ago and sadly had to be cancelled due to the pandemic lockdown. But as I found out when I gave my Gresham lecture this year, having an online platform means many, many more people can attend from the all too familiar comfort of their own homes. This ability to reach more people is of great importance to the City of London. We believe that culture should be open to all, which is why I'm so proud to support the city's cultural institutions, from the Barbican Centre to the Museum of London. And of course, Gresham College, who have been doing some fantastic work during the lockdown, ensuring their lectures are free and of a high standard, available for everyone. I'm also pleased to be working with the Burley 500 Foundation, we want to tell the world about the role and impact of Lord Burley, Queen Elizabeth I's most trusted advisor. For everyone who has joined us tonight, we really do have a treat for you. Tonight's lecture brings you both the past and the present. With historian Stephen Alford, the author of a biography of Lord Burley, speaking about the history of Tudor spies and a modern spook Sir Richard Dearlove, head of the British Secret Intelligence Service from 1999 to 2004, who will be speaking about the modern day secret service. Will we find out that Burley was the precursor to Bond? Well, only time will tell. Once again, thank you everyone for joining. And I'm now delighted to hand over to Professor Alford. William Cecil, first Baron of Burley, dominated Elizabethan politics for 40 years. He served Queen Elizabeth I as an advisor of deep experience, a politician to his fingertips, a broker of power. In his 20s, he had quickly worked his way up the career ladder, first as a servant in the late 1540s of Protector Somerset, uncle to King Edward VI. At the age of 32, he was appointed as Edward's secretary and a Privy Councillor. A natural recruit to the shadow government of Princess Elizabeth in the last months of Mary I, he was ready when, in November 1558, Elizabeth became Queen. After that, he saw uninterrupted service until the day he died in 1598. Privy Councillor, Principal Secretary, Lord Treasurer, Master of the Court of Wards and Liveries, Baron of Burley and Knight of the Garter power, office, influence and control by means of paper, patronage and counsel on policy, all underpinned by a self-consciously Roman work ethic. For William Cecil's guide was on duties, Cicero's timeless handbook on the reconciliation of public service with individual virtue. He was never off duty. He was Her Majesty's voice on paper, and the advisor who in audience gave her good news as well as bad. His opinion was always heard and always mattered, and he exercised power with an easy authority. His commitment was absolute, his focus intense. As he wrote to his son, Sir Robert Cecil, in 1598, serve God by serving of the queen, for all other service is indeed bondage to the devil. The strains of work were heavy. Power came with a cost. So pestered with business is a characteristic phrase. Once allowed a precious few days of leave from court, Sir William said that he felt like a bird freed from its cage, but he was still working. Crises and panics at home and abroad occurred with metronomic regularity. Elizabeth would make decisions, but then change her mind, often changing it back again. Colleagues fell out with one another. 
Burley's own health suffered, but he never rested, for still urgent papers piled ever higher on his desk, still hopeful suitors for favour and patronage clogged the corridors outside his chambers at home and court. He was a planner, an organiser, a formidable processor of information, above all, a pragmatist. In policy papers and memoranda, he considered every fact, every angle, every consequence of action and inaction. Delay and procrastination offended his instincts and his experience. He conceived of his service to Elizabeth as a kind of sacrament. He called it divinity. In policy, he knew that reality fell a long way short of perfection. Too much was rushed and left only half done. An ounce of advice was better acted upon in good time than when danger threatened. But as long as I have served the Queen's Majesty, he once wrote, Epimetheus, afterthought, hath had more to do than Prometheus, forethought. William Cecil was the superlative technician of the art of policy a skilled diagnostician of power. He characterized the Queen's secretary himself as an artificer of practices and councils. He was a craftsman in the workshop of politics. The European setting for espionage in the 16th century meant that it was a flourishing trade. Divided by religion, Western Europe was riven in the case of France, by religious and dynastic civil war, or in the Netherlands, rebellion, as the armies of Catholic Spain menaced Protestant states. The fragility of the English royal succession, the presence in England till her execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, the infiltration of Catholic priests and Jesuits into the kingdom, the fear of invasion, the plottings of a ragbag of emigre dissidents and fantasists with variable foreign backing, King Philip II, the Popes, the Dukes of Guise, all of these gave to the mid-Elizabethan decades a Cold War aspect. For Elizabethans, the greatest danger was security, a word which to them meant carelessness, overconfidence, complacency. In these times, intelligences, spies, official and unofficial, flourished. For information was essential to all sides, just as it was vulnerable to febrile politics and to manipulation by rivals at court. Espionage was a patronage game, information and exchangeable commodity, to be converted into cash or credit with patrons or even fixed office and preferment. Many courtiers and privy councillors had their own sources of delicate information, for in their world there was no secret service as such, no bureaucracy, no fixed career structure, few expectations of professionalism, little by way of testing and corroboration other than instinct and experience. But it was the Queen's secretary who was the preeminent master of intelligence gathering often in consultation with Elizabeth herself. The Queen was briefed and might insist on reading secret papers, this occasionally to the frustration of her ministers. Secret intelligence was held by the secretary in his office. For Lord Burley at Burley House on the Strand, for Sir Francis Walsingham at his house on Seething Lane at the Tower of London or his country retreat at Barn Elms, or indeed for any secretary, wherever the court happened to be. In the months that followed Walsingham's death in April 1590, Queen Elizabeth herself presided over the transfer of his cabinets and boxes of secret papers into the custody of her vice chamberlain, Sir Thomas Hennage, and so on to Burley. Those papers still at Walsingham House in October, but Burley had bundled up and brought to Westminster. The file kept by the middle 1590s in the office of Sir Robert Cecil of about 30 or so pages, containing his intelligence's names and ciphers, records of payment made to them, was modelled on Walsingham's and his father's system. 
The circle of trust was small. Only a privileged secretary or two should have access to sensitive papers and ciphers. A treatise written on the principal secretaryship in 1592 says, let your secret services be known to a few. The Lord Treasurer Burley being secretary had not above two or three. A secretary should have full confidence in his servants. You must have a care that they which be about you be no advertisers of any matters, but where and when and to whom you shall appoint. Just as a minister gave his personal service to the Queen, so intelligence has worked directly to ministers, and sometimes in their households. Diplomacy and secret intelligence blurred. Intelligences sent abroad by the secretary on covert missions might also serve as royal couriers paid from the accounts of the Queen's chamber. The most skilled cryptanalyst of his generation, Thomas Phillips, was Walsingham's servant, as well as a royal pensioner, and later on, an official of the London's Cust London Customs House. He was on standby for anyone who needed his skills. Walsingham, Burley, the Queen herself. He himself had a clear conception of what this work was. To Sir Robert Cecil, in 1600, he wrote that the principal point in matter of intelligence is to procure confidence with those parties that one will work upon, or for those parties a man would work by. Phillips knew his own talents, advertising that dexterity I may have. After 1590, Lord Burley and Sir Thomas Hennage set about pruning back those intelligences they had inherited from Secretary Walsingham, many of whom had been on the payroll for a number of years, some known to be compromised, and selling their services to the enemy. They retrenched, exposing just how slim good intelligence was, especially on Spanish military and naval dispositions in the years after the Great Armada. Politics began to intrude, most particularly the rise of the ambitious Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, as well as Lord Burley's own longer term planning for his son Robert. Thomas Phillips, for one, found himself caught up in these power games. For a time, to Walsingham's death, he funded agents out of his own purse, until in 1591 he was taken into the service of Essex. Essex, keen to build up his own reputation as a foreign policy and intelligence specialist, had high hopes for Phillips and gave him a generous budget. Phillips was recruited for Essex by Francis Bacon. With Bacon's brain and Phillips's long experience, success was surely inevitable. The operation they contrived played to Phillips's specialism. The penetration of emigre groups of dissident Catholic, Catholics in the Netherlands with the use of double agents. And Essex enthusiastically touted it at court, but they failed at least in delivering spectacular success. Essex wanted a quick return for his money. His self-advertisement backfired. The Queen was unimpressed. Phillips's political credit was quickly in the red. What followed for Thomas Phillips were some difficult years, and he occupied himself in the later 1590s with trying to attract Lord Burley's patronage. Burley, however, kept him at arm's length, using Phillips only to break enemy, enemy cryptograms or tease out the creases in imperfect diplomatic ciphers. Rejected by Essex and not wholly trusted by the Cecils, Phillips knew as well as anyone how fragile an occupation secret service so often was. Lord Burley was a compulsive strategist, especially when it came to the career of his son Robert. After 1590, he was carrying the weight of exchequer, and wards and liveries, as well as acting as principal secretary, a post the Queen left unfilled for six years. Positioning Robert Cecil became a priority, 1591, a key year. In May, Burley put on an entertainment for the Queen's progress to his house at Tibbles in Hertfordshire, appointed, none too subtly, to Robert's promise. The future was now. When Elizabeth left Tibbles, she knighted Robert. 
Three months later, in August, he swore the oath of a privy councillor. It just so happens that in the summer of 1591, Robert Cecil's promotion and one case study in espionage intersect beautifully. In May of that year, two English Catholic priests, John Snowden and John Fixer, were captured at sea on their way to Amsterdam and found themselves held in custody at Burley House on the Strand. Snowden's mission had been to gauge the likely reception in England of an invading Catholic army. He was the emissary of the English Jesuit Robert Parsons and secretary to Cardinal William Allen, two of the most dangerous and energetic emigres working to destabilise Queen Elizabeth's government. What's fascinating about Snowden in particular is the clarity with which we can trace, step by step, his recruitment as a double agent by Lord Burley and Sir Robert Cecil. Father and son worked together, establishing the truth of Snowden's story, testing each element of it, preparing him carefully for his return to the continent, finessing his explanation of his months in England, setting out the practical arrangements for passports and secret future communications. The psychological aspects of Snowden's confinement over three months are compelling, as we see in the papers his early bravado faltering under close questioning. Burley, the hard interrogator, Sir Robert, the sympathetic ear. The layers of who Snowden really was were carefully stripped away. For Snowden, there were only obligations of service and no guarantees. Given the stringent penal laws against Catholic priests working in secretly in England, he was fortunate to be alive. And Burley made this very clear to him, using Sir Robert Cecil as his messenger. It is expected at your hands that this great favour showed you must bring forth good fruit with profitable correspondency for Her Majesty's service and your country's good, which is the true end of your enlargement and cause of this extraordinary favour, which many others do thirst for. Snowden was freed, in other words, on clear conditions of acceptable service. The investment of effort in his case was worth it. Snowden went on to report to Robert Cecil on Spanish military and political thinking and the activities of Jesuits working secretly in Scotland. He forwarded letters he intercepted, these by some of Elizabeth's most formidable enemies. There were Catholic rumours of his disloyalty and in 1597, reliable sources of news in Antwerp said that Snowden was under the protection of certain English noblemen. In 1599, he was named publicly in a pamphlet as Lord Burley's spy, yet he survived. It's hard, even in the case of John Snowden, to discount or disregard politics. The fashion of the 1590s was for the big beasts of the Elizabethan court to reveal putative plots and conspiracies in the hope of impressing the queen with their energy of hunting down Her Majesty's enemies. With the Earl of Essex busily building up an intelligence service of his own, the Cecils necessarily countered, though sometimes Robert Essex and Sir Robert Cecil collaborated. So much energy, often so little design. So it was in the 1590s that, tellingly, various Spanish naval armadas against England went practically unnoticed. The tensions and inconsistencies are plain. Sometimes Elizabethan intelligence work was excellent. Sometimes it was atrocious. It was always about more than making informed policy. But that at least was an aspiration. By 1598, Sir Robert Cecil, by then the Queen's Secretary, had an espionage system in place. A consciously designed network of individuals often merchants or merchants factors in Spain, France and Rome, as well as in friendly countries like Sweden, Scotland and the United Provinces of the Netherlands, budgeted for in terms of annual allowances and one-off payments, 
and run mainly out of Sir Robert's private office. He also employed those he called spies and false brethren. He meant priests and Catholic informants, individuals like John Snowden. There was no one more sensitive to the dangers of complacency than Lord Burley, no sterner enemy to Her Majesty's enemies. In a particularly bruising early interview with John Snowden, Burley told the young Jesuit that what he had so far offered by way of information amounted to nothing more than vulgar and trivial intelligences and to no great purpose. Long experience gave him a formidably testing critical eye. The same was true of Sir Francis Walsingham and of Sir Robert Cecil. The author of the 1592 treatise on the secretaryship expressed it rather neatly. Be not too credulous, lest you be deceived. Hear all reports, but trust not all. Weigh them with time and deliberation, and be not too liberal of trifles. Observe them that deal on both hands, lest you be deceived. Uh, I'm now going to, uh, to, to pass you for a, for a modern perspective to Sir Richard Dearlove. Stephen, thank you very much. I think my role uh, in this event is to give a broader perspective on uh, the intelligence activity that Stephen has so brilliant, brilliantly uh, described. And uh, I'll try and give a historical perspective and bring it up to modern times and talk a little bit about my own experience, though my ability to do that is, of course, somewhat limited by circumstance. Um, I think it's important to stress that England, and then, of course, historically, the United Kingdom has been an important intelligence power. And if you look at the modern intelligence community, there are a number of historical examples of predecessor organizations. And you have heard probably about one of the most important and also one of the best documented historically. Uh, it's clear that there is still a massive public fascination with espionage, which seems largely inexhaustible. So we hear about its history, we hear about its fiction, of which there's a lot, its heroes, its villains, some of them make believe, some of them real. And of course, uh, this lecture uh, reflects uh, that strong degree of interest. And of course, the espionage activity, which is described in many examples, has very deep old historical roots. And of course, there are famous references in the Bible and in Sun Tzu in the art of war. And if you look at, you know, mankind's seminal texts, there are lots and lots of references to the importance of intelligence in the making of strategy. But I think uh, the one thing I would emphasize is that when one is thinking about espionage stories, it's important to remember that espionage always has a specific purpose. And I would describe that as, you know, trying to gain advantage and make better decisions in the pursuit of an adversarial relationship or situation. Uh, you heard Stephen draw a parallel between the Cold War and 16th and 17th century Europe. And there's no question that Spain of the 16th and 17th century, if you wish, was the equivalent of the Soviet Union in terms of being the regional superpower fundamentally opposed to the rise of Protestant states in Northern Europe. And of course, a constant threat to Elizabeth's throne and to England's uh, safety. So if we look at the methods that uh, William Cecil and Walsingham were both using, uh, they are pretty classic. They were attempting to penetrate the Spanish-backed Catholic 
conspirators who wanted to overthrow Elizabeth. And uh, they were accessing also, as you've heard, their secret communications flowing between the Spanish court and their agents scattered around Northern Europe. They were using human intelligence. They were using a type of intercept and they were decrypting coded messages. Now, this is a description that could certainly apply to the West's response to the threat from the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Now, I think one of the important points that uh, Stephen made was that the system that he described was very much based on patronage and patronage networks. And it's historically only much later, and I'll come on to this in a minute, that the intelligence and security community in nation states was institutionalized. In fact, it doesn't really happen until the second half of the 19th century or the early part of the 20th century. I'll give you a good example of this. I was recently sent a book uh, to review about Venetian intelligence. And you know, Venice as a city-state greatly interests me. Um, having examined carefully the way that this book was written, in the end, I decided not to review it because it struck me that it was describing what I would have thought was Venetian diplomatic reporting and not espionage. And clearly there is a blurred line, a permeable line between what was considered to be diplomacy and diplomatic activity and what was considered espionage. Now, obviously, at their extremes, they're easy to distinguish, but there are many shades of grey. Um, and I think I would say, I would say this, wouldn't I, that, you know, to understand the clear distinction, you probably have to have done both. And certainly in my career, I was active in areas which I would have considered to be diplomacy, even secret diplomacy. And then, of course, uh, the running of cases as a spy master, uh, which was clearly uh, espionage. And I, I mean, it, it may surprise you to hear this, but there are, and I'm not going to name names or name countries, but there are clearly uh, a number of states that have so-called intelligence services, and I say so-called because they're pretty risk adverse. And they actually do very little spying indeed. They're mainly uh, concerned with analysis of material gathered from multiple sources. Now, the, the, the title of these lectures, which is Spying for Queen and Country, um, actually contains, I think, in a way, quite a subtle uh, point and a subtle distinction. Cecil and Walsingham were very much concerned with the safety of the Queen and her person, her personal safety was central to their concept of the nation's security. Uh, just as a symbol, this was a question of dynastic succession. But of course, once espionage becomes institutionalized, it's the country which becomes central and the national security becomes as it were, the security of the nation state. And if you wish, now the Queen, okay, an, an, an important symbol, but a symbol uh, she is. Um, now, to get on to the more specific point about how the service in which I spent most of my career evolved, the foundation happened very precisely in 1909, and the service, uh, uh, the, the secret intelligence services, um, typically referred to as MI6, grew out of naval intelligence. And of course, its first uh, chief, Mansfield Cumming, was an admiral. And it was a specific uh, intelligence response to the challenge that the German Imperial Navy was mounting 
to the global dominance of the Royal Navy during that period. And there are many, you know, predecessor organizations, but they all depend on individuals and private arrangements, which were important for a period of time. Maybe their papers were kept in archive, maybe they weren't. They disappeared, uh, there was no corporate memory, uh, and they uh, maybe were picked up historically later, but there was no continuous thread of, as it were, organized national espionage. Now, I think what's interesting about the history of MI6 is that from its foundation, it really focused on the collection of human intelligence, on, on spying, but it also had, as you have heard, uh, and this is a very strong sort of historical thread, an expertise in the decryption of uh, enciphered documents. And of course, that evolution we see to this day, where you have separate organizations, MI6 that really deals with human intelligence, and GCHQ at Cheltenham, which is the organization which covers intercept, decrypt, and of course now the uh, more complex issue of how you extract uh, intelligence from the analysis of big data flows. Now, I'm not going to talk about um, technology. That's not the subject of this evening's lecture, but the influence of technology has unquestionably, as it were, shifted the emphasis in some respects within the intelligence world and within the disciplines which are pursued to collect effectively intelligence. But what I would maintain, uh, and I'll come on to talk about a couple of specific cases, is that a well-placed spy in the enemy camp, who you can communicate with, who you can, as it were, interrogate imminently during a crisis is, especially valuable and especially important, particularly when uh, the nation is facing some desperate uh, threat, which is crucial, as it were, to its uh, survival. Um, and a well-placed asset uh, in this respect, uh, in a strategic position, is of inestimable importance. Now, part of the problem with intelligence history is we, we, we tend to publicize or know more about our failures than our successes. And of course, uh, we were recently reminded of one important failure and with the death uh, in Moscow of one of England's blackest traitors, George Blake. But there has been uh, a more of a move recently to publish something about our successes. And we have had, for example, the Penkovsky papers, the important uh, Soviet spy uh, during the Cuba crisis, who, as it were, provided the West with the intelligence that enabled effective uh, response on the part of the United States. And then uh, you probably are familiar with the Gordievsky case, where um, the United Kingdom, MI6, ran uh, an important penetration of the KGB uh, for a long period of time. And of course, Gordievsky defected and, and resettled uh, in the United Kingdom, having escaped with assistance from the Soviet Union. And that's recently been um, dramatized and explained in a rather interesting and successful book. Now, the two cases I was going to mention uh, briefly, you probably haven't heard of, but they are in the public domain, which is why I can talk about them. The first one actually is a French case, and the code name is called Farewell. And I was heavily involved in this case uh, because uh, it was a recruitment made in Paris by the French security service. And it was one of those cases which uh, 
exploded, as it were, in, 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 secretly in its importance because of the job that uh, Farewell, that's the code name, returned to in Moscow when he left Paris. Uh, he was a KGB officer who uh, specialised in scientific and technical information. And he was put in a key strategic job in Moscow where he had access to the whole of uh, the um, espionage industrial complex operated by the Soviet Union. And I won't go into the detail of how the case was actually run in Moscow, but it was done very cleverly. And the material from that case was hugely important. Some people think it was perhaps the most important uh, espionage case during the Cold War because it gave a, a precise insight into uh, Soviet weapons development, where they were lacking knowledge and trying to steal that from the West, and where they were particularly advanced and particularly sophisticated. And uh, over a period of time, Farewell gave the West a complete um, description of this aspect of the Soviet uh, strategic military economy. And the case is a good example of how an espionage case can become a bargaining chip because the French state used it uh, ruthlessly in, in order to have a much better and closer relationship with uh, Washington and um, that, as it were, quest was largely successful. Uh, there is a book published in French. There is a movie about the case. They're both uh, in French. But those of you who are French speakers, um, I strongly advise pursuit and interest in this case because it is so unique and so unusual. The other case I was going to mention briefly, uh, perhaps. Um, is less uh, spectacular, but it is an important case um, because of the insights that it gave the United Kingdom. And I was personally the case officer for this spy. And the reason that I can talk about it, because I can't normally talk about these things, is that the archives uh, containing details of the case have recently been released in the Czech Republic. Um, the case is important because it was a major penetration of the Czechoslovak uh, secret uh, services. Um, in particular, the section uh, within the Czechoslovak service uh, that was responsible for operating uh, cases against the United Kingdom and the key officer in that department was a British spy. Uh, therefore, we were able to, as it were, promote his career to make him look more successful than he would have been without our assistance, and therefore to widen his access uh, in this important Warsaw Pact service. Well, you may ask, you know, why was the Czech service uh, important or Czechoslovak service because it was before the country divided. And the reason that the service uh, was important was because uh, the Czech Republic in particular had a very sophisticated level of education and industry and a small but highly capable service. And for example, in the 1960s, maybe you are surprised by this fact, it had managed to recruit for uh, quite prominent members of parliament in the United Kingdom. So the, th the threat was serious and important, but uh, attack being the best means of defense, we were able, as it were, to remain uh, on top of the problem and know exactly what the capabilities were of our adversary and how, as it were, we could protect ourselves from this important uh, Soviet ally at the time. Uh, the case has 
a somewhat strange ending um, because the agent, whose code name was Freed, uh, actually died of a heart attack. Um, perhaps that was an aspect of the stress uh, that his espionage caused him. He wasn't in great health. But after the Velvet Revolution, uh, what he had hoped for actually happened. And what he had hoped for was that his daughter would, as it were, benefit from uh, what he had done. And uh, the new Czech government that replaced the communist government after the, the Velvet Revolution, um, led by Václav Havel, went, found this woman, and um, the very large sums of money that uh, Fried had accumulated uh, in the West, which he had not been able to touch when he was uh, an active uh, uh, intelligence officer, went to his daughter, who I'm now pleased to say is a very wealthy and successful businesswoman in Central Europe. Um, I hope that I have been able to establish, as it were, a thread that runs from Cecil and Walsingham to modern times and give you an idea of the commonality of the activity uh, conducted in order to protect this nation, despite the gap of 500 years between those experiences. There is a lot in common, but of course the biggest change now is that the organizations responsible for uh, conducting espionage and protecting our national security are highly professional, highly organized, uh, and very much operating within a legal and constitutional context. And uh, the, as it were, patronize, pa patronage arrangements, which were so characteristic, characteristic of Elizabethan times, have long disappeared. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. That, that, that was fascinating in a sense, kind of seeing the threads and the connections and the resonances over four, five hundred years. Um, I, I am really interested, it was very much in my mind uh, in putting together my side of the lecture in some of the kind of psychological aspects and the human aspects um, of this of this world, which which I of course see, you know, very much from the outside and you know from 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 the archives. I was particularly struck in in, in my sort of case study of of John Snowden, of being able to see, in a sense, um, the recruitment of an agent, um, the 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 questioning, the, the the kind of story, some of the motivations there, and something of that process. And I wondered really about the. The sort of relationship between um, agent and case officer handler in a modern context and, and whether you might tell us a little bit um, about those features really from your own experience. Well let's start basically with motivation because that's usually key to understanding a case. Um, in the French case, in the farewell case, um, the Russian officer, whose name was Vetrov, was something of a naughty boy, a risk taker. Uh, and what happened in Paris was he, he, he wrote off or smashed up <clears throat> an embassy, a Mercedes, and was in big trouble, um, but managed to go to a French friend he knew. And of course, uh, the French friend was in touch with the French security service. Uh, and they completely rebuilt the car over a weekend, so he didn't have to report the crash, <laughs> uh, which was quite an achievement because it was badly damaged. Um, but I think, the, 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 so that was the incident which triggered the start of his espionage. But I think that there were more reasons than that. You know, he liked the good life, he liked money. Uh, and, you know, he was, a he was vulnerable to that extent. I think partly uh, he, he, he was also an ideological spy, but his, his subsequent access was, was so important. Um, if, if, if you could look at the Russian documents he gave to the West, 
they were unprecedented in their detail uh, and their importance. And um, uh, the case really, it, it, it had such far-reaching consequences at the time. Um, I, mean, I can obviously speak more authoritatively because of my direct involvement in, in the second case, Freed. Um, he originally was what we call a walk-in. He offered his services. I think that the reason he offered his services were twofold. Uh, he felt that because he had a humble sort of peasant background, he had been discriminated against by senior officers and hadn't got as far in his career as he would have liked. And his, he, there was a sort of determination, I'll show you these bastards, um, you know, that I'm cleverer than they are. So there was no question. And then the other thing was he did want a different life for his daughter. He didn't want his daughter to be um, uh, you know, brought up in communist enforced uh, restraint and poverty for the rest of her life. Mm. Um, he certainly achieved the first because he absolutely turned the service upside down. Obviously, after its death, it was discovered what he had been doing and there was investigation. Um, and, and it caused absolute chaos. And, and um, the Russians came to conduct the investigation and closed down big chunks of the service and sack people. Uh, it, it, it really had resonance across a whole area of people and careers. Um, and of course, he 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 couldn't touch his money because in the circumstances in which these people spied, they had a lifestyle. And if you gave them the money, they would break the lifestyle and they would be immediately suspected. So mm. the money that he earned over time was all banked in the West. And um, you know what compound interest is like. And so by the time his daughter got the money, which was after the Velvet Revolution, bearing in mind that he, he had died back in, um, when did I leave? Oh, the mid eighties. Um, the sum of money was was very, very significant indeed. Uh, and of course, um, this poor girl had been discriminated against because the authorities knew that her father had been a spy. She, she never knew and she didn't understand why she had been dumped in some dreadful marginal job uh, and, and led a really pretty horrendous life but, and, and with no explanation. So the fact that a black uh, Mercedes turned up one day after the Velvet Revolution and said, you ought to come to the palace and meet Harville because he's got something to tell you. It was rather like a fairy tale. <laughs> um, the other question you ask is, is really important. And of course, that's about training intelligence officers. And as an intelligence officer running these sorts of cases, they are quite tricky. You have to be able to empathize. You have to be able to control um, these uh, rather strange characters. Um, really, you're looking to build a relationship, but not a relationship which can't be changed when you're replaced because inevitably you're, you're going to run it for four or five years. You're probably not going to run it for 20. Um, and it, 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 it's about striking exactly the right personal notes. So you, I think you need people who, who, who are able to sort of sublimate their personality, but at the same time remi remain quite strong characters. I mean, I, I, I think I could write a book about being a case officer in a, in, a, in a complex um, espionage case. And I think it, it, it's a very interesting reflection on what actually the profession is about in its extreme. I mean, a lot of people who join intelligence organizations never are spy masters. I mean, uh, but amongst that group, there are, a, 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 let's say, a cadre of people who, who, are, who are trained and developed. And I, I mean, for example, most of my early training was, was, was done often through role play. Uh, and you weren't quite sure whether the role play was real or not. I mean, it was pretty realistic. Um, and 
I started off doing this really at, at a ridiculously young age and spent nearly 35 years just running cases. I mean, that was my job for a very long time. Uh, enormously interesting. And, I, and of course, 99% of these cases that I can't talk about. It's just the ones that have, as it were, fallen out into the public domain. And even then, I mean, that's only because I was in a very senior position that I am really able to talk about them now. It is, it, it, it is that kind of human factor that, that I find interesting. And, and again, you know, from an archival point of view, um, I, I, I'm always conscious of being able to just get the tiniest kind of slither of that human experience, but conscious that so much so much else in a, in a sense would have been, you know, a kind of face to face um, sort of physical relationship in the sense of reading, of reading another person. Uh, and, you know, the, the if you were paper, able the, the surviving paperwork yeah. only ever gives you the tiniest no. sense of that. But if you were able to read the case files now, mm. you would find they're really rather extraordinary. Uh, if, if, if the case officers are conscientious, which most of them are, because they're, they're, there are sections of the file which are really about the person and the personal psychology and the behaviour and the family and, you know, what's actually going on in the person's mind. Then there are bits, of course, you know, which are the professional bits where you're discussing the intelligence and the sourcing and the subsourcing and all of that. Mm. But th these divisions are very clear and, and usually very highly documented. Now, I, I don't think, you know, in, in, in Cecil's case, they would be documented <laughs> to that extent because they probably... <laughs> and, and, of course, there's a slight insecurity about writing this stuff down. I mean, you, you might well prefer not to write certain things down, but, of course, now, legally, and, and because of constitutional rules and context, you know, you're pretty much obliged to, to have a very precise and detailed record. Well, of course, for the people I work on, I mean, the, the, there's, there is, in a sense, no need for transparency. No, exactly. Or, or scrutiny, yeah. other than from the Queen herself, which I think is really... Well, I think that's fascinating yeah. because, yeah. Um, well, anybody who's read extensively about um, the crises after 9-11 and the invasion of Afghanistan and the Iraq war will know that certain ministers, Blair in particular, took a great interest and you know, liked to see actual papers and were much criticised for doing that. Um, <laughs> and I, I mean, I had people, you know, say to me after the time I'd been chief during this period, you know, Richard, you, you, you really shouldn't have shared these things with the prime minister, but you don't go to see the Prime Minister and say to the Prime Minister, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you that. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. Yeah. I mean, you might say, well, I think there's some certain things I shouldn't tell you. Um, but what's extraordinary about, you know, being in that type of crisis is that, you know, you have a very immediate relationship uh with the primary players you know whether it's sitting in the white house talking to george w or sitting in number 10 and talking to the prime minister they want to talk to their heads of intelligence if you're fighting a war it's uh, and i think it would have been very similar in elizabethan times mm. um uh, the, the the personal aspect uh, becomes as important as the institutional aspect. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think, I mean, not, I mean, clearly not on the same scale, um, but some of that sense of, you know, working with these rather sort of shadowy individuals in, in, in nooks and corners and, you know, meetings in kind of various sort of insalubrious bits of London, like, you know, sort of Paris Garden, just, just across the Thames. Yeah. Um, you know, all that sort of, to the court, you know, an, an audience for the Queen, you know, who, who wants to look at the papers. Yeah. Um, 
uh, or you know instructions to kind of break open secret boxes for ciphers or or, or whatever you, yeah. you do get a sense you know probably at a but by by 20th and 21st century standards you know a tiny sort of micro sort of slice of it but you do get a sense of you know the the movement from the very very small players um you know to in a sense that that was right at the very top you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it, it it's fascinating, and and I, I mean I think what's so interesting about the Elizabethan example is because it is as an affair of state important and central to what's going on, yeah. and they are employing techniques which are clearly not diplomatic. I, I mean they have crossed that line yeah. clearly into espionage. Yes. And it, 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 it's quite difficult to identify where the line, but when you're well on one side of it, you know you're, you know, you're in that territory and they clearly are in that territory. And um, I mean, ever since I was in the service, you know, we, we very much looked to that period as, as the first period in English history when it's absolutely clearly and precisely designated that, you know, there is a sort of nas- national espionage effort being conducted. And then, of course, during the Civil War, you've got Thurlow yes. Um, yes. doing the same for Cromwell, yes. you know, whereas the, the Royalists were hopeless. <laughs> Charles I couldn't, couldn't hack it. Um, but, but, but the new model army and, and Thurlow, they were very precise, highly organised, um, and using absolutely clear in, in, in intelligence techniques to give themselves a military advantage in the Civil War. And then it sort of disappears again. And I, I, I mean, it, I, the other bit that I didn't mention, but I think is quite important, um, is the existence of the secret vote, which was a separate sum of money not voted through Parliament, which was available uh, as an arm of foreign policy. And, and, and basically, yes. that sum of money, which, for example, during the Napoleonic Wars is so important in stitching together military alliances, and, and that's done sort of clandestinely by Pitt, um, actually becomes the money eventually, which pays for the institutions of the Secret Service post-1909, and the secret vote starts being spent on these agencies. But that sum of money... Um, uh, is that that is a historical constant, and it, it it's always there in the background, mm. um, <clears throat> and how it's spent, it, it's done without any, as it were, transparency or accounting. Mm. In in a way that absolutely begins in the in the Elizabethan period with yeah. Privy seals, you know, the, privy seals, absolutely. In, in a sense of the discretion of the secretary to to spend. So I mean, it means that tracing the the money, you know, sometimes it came from oh the the, the treasurer of the the queen's chamber, or occasionally you know would come out of the the, the purse of an individual secretary and you know be handed over by 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 his steward, you know, to 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 an agent. Um, but but often it's through privy seals, and that you know that they're extraordinary. It's, it, it, very, very difficult to kind of trace the, the money, you know, in, in it a is, way. It's extraordinary. And yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, w- one of the jobs I had before I became chief, <clears throat> um, when the legislation for the agencies was introduced, we had to wind up the secret vote. And, you know, it became the SIV, the single intelligence vote. But the secret vote was pots of money and other ministries budgets <clears throat> by then but actually spent on the intelligence community i had to go around literally the uk trying to find <laughs> where all this money <laughs> was was hidden uh, Where's on, the other gold people, on other people's <laughs> books <clears throat> and try to work out how big the sum was because no one was quite sure and there were just sort of Baroque structures which had grown up during World War II. And, and I, I mean, I, I discovered some absolutely wonderful things. Uh, I mean, hilariously funny too, you know, uh, like, you know, petrol pumps which filled up various service cars which were 
you know, a, a Bowser turned up on a Wednesday, filled this petrol tank up, and no one was quite sure where it came from or where it was going. <laughs> of course, you couldn't do that now in this day and age, but this was as late as the, well, the, 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 when the legislation came in. <laughs> I think in good Elizabethan tradition in, 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 in many ways, <laughs> both, <laughs> both, 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 uh, both, both planning, but, but also an, an, an element of the entire sort of random about it as well. Yeah. It's wonderful. And, and, and amazing flexibility. And of course, yeah. uh, there, was, there was money sort of stashed around Europe after World War II, <clears throat> which was never actually properly collected up sitting in various banks and things. Mm, mm, fascinating. Well, look, thank you. I, I, I think, unfortunately, I, I could go on for very much, for, for a long time, but I, I think we're pretty much out of... Out of I, think, I think we are. Anyway, yeah. Steve, it's been great. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I look forward to the actual event. I'm sure we'll get lots of questions. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks so much, Richard. All, all the very best. Yeah, thank you. All you the best. Too. There are many people that I have to thank for this evening. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about today's event is that it, it, that it took place at all. That it did so is a tribute to the tenacity and generosity of spirit of a very large number of people. I think, of course, immediately of our joint sponsors, Gresham College, led by Simon Thurley, who I'm glad to say is a patron of the Lord Burley 500 Foundation, and indeed the deliverer last year of a distinguished and fascinating lecture on Sicilian architecture. Uh, together with his colleague, Dr. Claire Lochlin Chow, and her team. Faced with a virus, they barely turned a hair when taking on the administrative difficulties of morphing a, ha, a, a live event in the Guildhall via a, at one moment, projected halfway house uh, into something which became a wholly online event. Our team has been hugely grateful for their professionalism and enthusiasm uh, throughout uh, the arrangements. And uh, I do thank them most severely, sincerely for what they've done. I'm equally grateful to my Lord Mayor and the Corporation of the City of London. My Lord Mayor, you have given a very elegant introduction, if I may say so today, and have given us every support, as indeed has my old friend Paul Double, the Remembrancer, who, like Dr Thurley, is also a patron of our Foundation. Actually, there's almost no commemorative enterprise that I've been involved in over the years where I have not enjoyed Paul's enthusiastic and constructive support. The Lord Burley 500 Foundation is the latest in that line. It'll be a relief to you to know, Paul, that unlike you, I'm getting too old for this sort of thing, and this is probably the last time that I shall trespass on your good nature. However, in this, as in so much else over the years, I owe you a very great deal. So thanks to you particularly. Now, I do think it's appropriate that Gresham's name and the City of London's name should be associated with these celebrations. Gresham himself, after all, collaborated with Burley in stabilising the currency after the accession of Queen Elizabeth I, and in doing so, creating the conditions which enabled the city to become the financial powerhouse it remains to this day. Among others, I must also thank, are my distinguished steering committee on the foundation and, of course, my kinswoman and co-chairman, Miranda Rock of Burley House. And in that category, of course, especially, I must thank Nog Sorden and Shana Fleming, who are really the engine room of our efforts and without whom nothing at all would happen. My principal task this evening is to thank our two speakers. Professor Alford's book, The Watchers, I found utterly compelling when I first read it, and I know we 
uh, were, I knew we were in for a treat when he kindly accepted our invitation over a year ago. Equally, Richard Dearlove was as compelling this evening. And if any, I draw any conclusion from their joint efforts, uh, the contrasts in his field between the 16th and 21st centuries in the world of espionage are, are obvious. Um, but equally, I think the objectives and techniques of the trade seem to be curiously unchanged. So I suppose we can conclude at least on one thing, that the human factor is the same and is equally important. After all, as I think Kant once observed, we're all made of the same crooked timber, both in the 16th century and in the 21st. So thank you both, both speakers, for a hugely memorable experience. You've not only provided illumination, but have been charmingly flexible about the mechanics we've needed to put this show on uh, in the face of the assaults of the virus. So thank you for that too, and for your patience. Perhaps the people I should thank most is all of you who've uh, turned out to listen and to watch this evening. Uh, we're delighted by your interest and indeed relieved by the sheer numbers who have applied. It's meant that paradoxically, we've reached perhaps a wider audience than if we'd been, a we'd been able to stick to the original plan. So there are some unforeseen beneficial consequences to the virus, perhaps. I'm biased for obvious reasons, but um, if your interest encourages my family's view that the 500th anniversary of the old boy's birth is worth celebrating, uh, then um, uh, this has been a well worthwhile effort. Burley did so much to create the Britain of the centuries that followed his death and there are so many parallels, aren't there, between his age of huge change and ours, both of them driven inevitably by great developments in technology. I hope that as our programme of, uh, of events unfolds, that you'll all be able to support this programme. Um, you will find them listed on our website, some will be virtual because of the virus. Others have been postponed to next year, including the great service in Westminster Abbey, which we are due to hold in June 2022, uh, thanks to the enthusiasm of the Dean, who is himself a distinguished Tudor historian. I hope that representatives of causes and institutions that were dear to Burley's heart will attend, but also as many descendants of Burley as possible will make the time to come and commemorate their great ancestor's birth. As far as the Lord Burley Foundation itself is concerned, we, of course, will be uh, coordinating the events uh, to mark the 500th anniversary but we hope we'll also be able to leave a relatively modest legacy as a result of this year's activities. We hope that that legacy will be in the form of bursaries and fellowships at St John's College, Cambridge, which was Burley's own college and a forcing house for people of his persuasion in the 16th century, but also other educational institutions, perhaps schools in particular around uh, houses where Burley himself uh, was influential and was connected. If any of you wanted to contribute to that legacy, we would be both touched and grateful, and details again are on our website. It only remains for me to say once again an enormous thank you to all of you, but particularly to our two speakers for their magnificent contribution in yet another of the events uh, that we are putting on. We are very grateful indeed to you both and thank you so much for taking the trouble and for informing us so splendidly this evening.